guys uh, in terms of questions as possible. I know that we've got probably a mix of uh, investors potentially in the room. So maybe some slides here are redundant for some of you and others uh, not. So just bear with us on that. I guess where we're coming from um, as a foundation is looking at the uh, the gap in the market that exists not just in India but globally. Um, it is a particular gap in India given the size of given the size of the market. So and what we're talking about is debt for um, businesses that are too large to attract uh, microfinance funding and too small to attract uh, VCT funding. So we, we call it this the, the missing middle segment. Um, and we see that segment broadly being underserved by banks. Uh, banks are doing a lot of lending to organizations or companies that have uh, full collateral to offer, in which case banks are indeed offering uh, a lot of debt. Um, but for the vast bulk of the, sec of the, of the sector, of the, of the market, um, upwards of 60 to 70% of that market, you've got a real dearth or a real lack of lenders who are actually able to provide debt of, say, less than four crores or less than a million dollars. Um, and so that's what, from that perspective, we see as a foundation that, that space being vital to grow sectors that we care about in particular, and those are energy and infrastructure and access to affordable basic services. Um, we saw a lot of portfolio companies that were in that space that simply could not um, attract debt. Uh, and we heard also a lot, and this might be familiar to some of you in the room, but we heard a lot of people talking about the subject and wanting to do something in the space, or a lot of lenders saying that we are going to be doing something or that we are lending. Um, and we were both kind of frustrated by that, um, by that um, inaction. In fact, few lenders, in fact, were were were, were deploying capital in the market. So we, um, in partnership with Telecap, um, uh, trialed a new business, a new way of lending called viability-based lending. It looks, uh, as the name suggests, based on the the strength of the company, to the entrepreneur, as opposed to the way a bank might look at the company and say, "Where is your collateral?" and then let's worry about what your business model is after. Um, so what we did was co-create with Intellicap, a business called Intelligro Finance Company, uh, which is specifically looking at that missing middle segment. And it's been in operation for about 18 or so months. Um, and it is rapidly scaling up. And we are seeing, as a business, uh, far more demand for capital than right now we have capital to, uh, to online. So it's very clear that the business is uh, indeed attracting or is targeting a segment that is vastly, vastly underserved. So maybe go to the first slide. Um, this is the. This is kind of where we're coming from. So we're we're looking at debt that is customized, debt that is not. I mean, I'm sure any anybody here has interacted with um, with a local bank, and this is not an India issue. It's again, it's a global issue. Uh, they try to fit you as an entrepreneur into a particular box. And if you don't fit in that box, then forget about it. But the idea here was to provide a loan loan products that are customized to meet the needs of a business. Um, we also, I guess the, the core proposition also that banks are not able to provide is around the incredibly short processing time. So a bank, even if a bank were able to lend, the, the, the time lag between application and actual funding, even if it does get approved, tends to be incredibly long. Um, and we're talking many, many months as opposed to <coughs> weeks. And again, this is not a at all a slight on, on banks. I think yeah. banks have a fantastic purpose <laughs> in India and that they're in, in any country and they have a very clear mandate to lend based on their models. This is not saying banks are bad and we're good. This is saying banks are fit a particular segment of the market and we are addressing one that banks are unable to, to serve. Um, this is kind of how we're looking at it structurally. So on the one side you've got, maybe I'll stand up to point out what this looks like. So if you're a, if you're a business with Full collateral at any scale, almost that uh, you're, you're pretty well covered by, or you should be pretty well covered by a bank. And equally, if you're looking for a relatively small amount of, uh, of money, so maybe two lakhs um, or below in terms of um, Indian rupees, there's a pretty burgeoning microfinance space, as you know, in this country that, that will be able to uh, tackle you. And above the million dollar mark, uh, also a market that is pretty well served by VCPE. Uh, funders, but there's this massive gap in the middle, which we call the missing middle, where uh, there are really no formal dedicated MBFCs. I think some of you might have heard you'll have you'll have one-off lenders, or you'll have special exceptions, or you'll have um, banks where you'll have a particular connection to the CEO, and you'll manage to get a 
you managed to get uh, uh, debt on, a, on an exception basis. But on a vast majority of cases, that is, that is really not a market that's been typically served. And also the other, uh, obviously the, the requirement by, by banks um, is the track record. So if you're, um, if you're less than three years in operation or less, you're less than three years in, in profitability, it becomes uh, impaired. So again, it's not at all trying to serve this market, which is being served very well. It's trying to look at something uh, entirely different. Um, and this is kind of what, I mean, some of you will be more interested in this than others. From a, from a, from a high level perspective, the, the gap in the market in terms of demand and supply for MSME or for small medium enterprise debt is just so if you're out there uh, in the audience looking for debt, um, you're, you're not alone. There's a massive, massive number of, of businesses in the millions actually that cannot attract um, debt for, for obvious reasons. Um, the reason why we put it as $107 billion, we have to put it in Indian rupees, it becomes 4.77 lakh crores. So it was easy to write $107 billion. <clears throat> One thing about this particular segment is, uh, while you're talking about a missing middle of $107 billion. This $107 billion is the figure of 2010. And this gap is actually growing at 8% year on year. And if there is a gap like this, why is it not being bridged? So the earlier slide when we have built it up, it's because in this segment, you know, like with banks, I'm not trying to scare the borrowers who are going to go to the bank. Please don't take it that way. But the banks have got certain compulsions. As was stated earlier, it requires three years uninterrupted profitable track record. And <coughs> importantly, they should be able to give collaterals. Now, added to this, banks' ticket size is bigger because of the trading cost. And importantly, the collaterals are very important. And they put a stringent credit norms because we are actually passing through a time. We have basin free, we have prudential norms, we have stress test for the banks, which is, you know, which is, this is more global and it's being pushed global to every country. And they have to be compliant. So this gap is there and we will continue to do that. So that's the opportunity which we have. Does anybody have any questions just at the, at the high level? In terms of how we're, how we're looking at the space or where the gap does exist. Go, go ahead and What proportion is this of overall credit? The SME, the SME credit, the yeah. SME sector, or yeah. the gap, can yeah. you give me an idea of? Yeah, see, the thing is, the addressable market which we are looking at, which will be easier for me to put it, is actually $20 billion. Okay, out of that, 61% is working capital. I'm looking at working capital, I'm not going to talk about so 61% of 20 billion, that is roughly around 12 billion is my market size. This is, this is the demand you're, you're asking about, right? It's sort of... No, the diff see, 107 billion dollars, out of this 107 billion dollars, what is my addressable segment? I mean, my addressable segment is 20 billion dollars, and 61% of that is only for working capital. I'm not into term loan. So 61% of 20 billion dollars, which is 12 billion dollars, it's a very big amount. Sixty thousand first. Well, it compares to two hundred fifty-one billion, which is the total demand, uh, and that's just looking at the MSME sector. Right. So large. That is eighteen percent of the total uh, uh, GDP or the requirement credit requirement. Eighteen percent is this. So you can extract it. Uh, yeah, when I really on, on, on the point that you made about why this money is not there, uh, you know, and you, uh, money you pointed out uh, about the fact that you know the, the typical sort of you know paperwork and you know collateral etc. Et but do you think <coughs> this has also got to do with the fact that you know many um, have not been able to successfully devise a product that works? You know, I mean, in financial services, of course, you know, I operate agree. a certain margins etc. But uh, you know, businesses like you know, I'm not sure what all uh, you know, Delhi Grow is supporting, but. Uh, you know, business like an education, healthcare, I mean, are there products that can, you know, I mean, can they even operate in a commercially viable manner, you know, their ability to service debt, you know, I mean, is that also a challenge? Uh, we, we are looking at those who are in, uh, viability based. See, we are cash flow financials. Now, cash flow, also there is an element of fund flow is cash. That is, the person will be in a position to raise equity. Now, there is one slide which we are getting into on that, but typically what happens, small and medium, 
business. And I'm talking about the segment which I'm talking about, or vulnerable because they don't get working capital. But working capital is a very important thing for them to scale up and to become fully viable. So when you don't have that working capital, and let me tell you, this is like, it's not a debt against equity or equity against debt. It's not that way. But the thing about it is, which we'll show in the latest slides also, there are very few. Is that when you have debt, when you can raise a formal debt in this sector, you are able to raise more debt. Because when you come in as a first printer and you give him debt, he gets a recognition in the market. Okay? And he is able to borrow. Now, it doesn't stop there. He is able to get equity also. And equity investor says, can you raise debt? And he says, yes, I can raise debt. He is getting the surety of his raising equity is also. I am telling this all because I am also doing equity raising and I am ensuring that debt is equity. Your question on, on the reason why more haven't come in or why we don't have a burgeoning market in this space is the short answer is, is because it's very difficult to do successfully. So what what we need to do, I think, and where people have failed in the past is to pretend that this segment that we're looking at is or should be served in the same way that a bank would serve it. And maybe not. maybe I mean uh, what I think I mean, there's a reason, you know, besides all the bureaucracy or whatever, I mean the reason is that probably a, a commercially uh, you know viable debt may not work for some of these segments also. Is that the reason? Uh, you know, I mean, so See, it depends upon, yes, to, to an extent you are right, in the sense that if you don't have proper capitalization, then a debt will not solve your problem. But we are talking about a situation where they have a little amount of equity which will be, they will be able to become viable if they have supporting debt, because if they have a supporting debt, they get equity further, and then they get leverage again that equity for debt. So we are not talking about a person who is coming with one rupee and getting a don't for this. No, not at all. But those who put the money, they find it difficult. Business can't take debt, it can't take debt. So we're not trying to force fit a product into a company that isn't structured or isn't able to take that with that product. Next slide. And I guess where we look at it um, in terms of where, just in terms of stage of business where this products or where, where Intelligro fits in is post the startup phase. So we have lent in rare cases to startups, but for an, on an exception basis, the typical client or the typical customer um, is between 12 and 36 months, i.e. mostly unbankable, and are in that stage where they're growing pretty rapidly. Um, obviously, in, in some cases, there will be some <coughs> equity component that might be able to come in here, but that's really what we're talking about. Post 36 months, um, in most cases, uh, uh, other financiers might, might be able to our, our, our idea here is that if one of our clients ends up coming off our products and becomes bankable, then that's ideal, right? We move, we move from one, one segment to the other. It's not that strictly it is 36 months, because sometimes, you know, you have clients who have been in the business who get the first PE round, other than their investment after 36 months or even after 40 months. Or the second round comes up. So this is kind of a wordy one, Mani, why don't you... Uh, yeah, because uh, uh, we are for-profit companies. We don't lend to non-profit organizations. And the types of uh, the uh, business organization we lend are of uh, private limited and public limited. And uh, we don't finance trust or any other. Um, our, you know, we're talking about a segment. Somebody asked about that this segment. This is my segment. In the sense that I finance companies, those who have bought a turnover of less than or up to 50 years. And um, see, the thing is, uh, audited financials we prefer. Um, see, the, the financials when we talk about, when banks insist on, they insist on profitable financial record and financial statements. We are not unduly <coughs> concerned on that particular point. We are cash flow financials. We insist on uh, audited financials just to see the corporate governance and the level to which the person can. Um, the sectors is energy and um, affordable basics. You know, we are talking about healthcare. We have financed healthcare. We have financed trip irrigation, sanitation, education, supply chain, agriculture supply chain, and including financial inclusion. We've taken a pretty broad definition of what access to basic services means and what energy and infrastructure means. So we've looked at some businesses that are very obviously high social impact and that are generating a huge social impact for this business. Um, 
We've also looked at businesses that would not attend the sand belt or wouldn't feel at home here, are nuts and bolts businesses that have no particular desire to, to have a social impact, but happen to be in one of these centers. We're looking at them as, if you can grow the energy and affordable basic services sectors, you are by definition, or the derivative of that is a social impact. So we're not hung up on whether the business itself is serving BOP customers only. Some of our customers will have that BOP focus, but many, many will not. That's kind of and uh, tenure is anywhere between three months to say that 24 months we may even go up to 36 months. But we are in working capital. And we are for short term. Short term is defined as 36 months or more. And uh, we started with 30 lakhs when we did the first lending. It's 40 lakhs. First lending. We have done one lending for 30 lakhs, but most of our lending is our average, if I put a median, it's at and around one. And um, we, as we are cash flow based financials, we actually coincide the uh, repayments according to the cash flow position. There may be bulge. Because some companies who have a steady cash flow, they have spikes. And some of them which are actually into you know dealing with government and all that, they give it over a period of time and you know more towards the budget getting closed. So accordingly we adjust all that. And seasonality. For instance, we had financed to a drip irrigation company, which was uh, totally dependent, you know, the maximum sales happen before monsoon. And post monsoon they start getting the money. So cash flows are fitted accordingly. Collateral, as we said in the very beginning, is not a free question. But yes, we do take a little bit of collateral. There are cases where we are not taking collateral at all. And let me also tell you one thing. 50% of the cases which we have financed so far, they are just breaking even or some of them are making losses. Only 50% of the problem. But what we are looking at is by the We expect that the company money. and they have paid all of our money. Money, I have a basic question. So uh, when you talk about energy, are you talking about energy or energy in general? Sorry? When you're talking about energy, yeah. are you talking about clean energy or energy in general? Both. It's the latter. Sorry? It's the latter. So it's we have a very broad definition of what energy means. And why is it different from affordable basic services? Why is that different? Why energy is kept separately from the... It's only because um, we're, we're looking at it with a particular focus. So okay. we've, got, we've done a lot of energy uh, 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 loans in the past. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at that segment in particular. So not just energy provision, but efficiency, distribution. Um, so we'll, we'll separate it out for that reason. But if, indeed, it could be part of that, that same thing. Does anybody have any... There's a lot of info on this. Slide here, sir. Is there any questions? Right, money, cost of, cost of funds. Cost of? Interest rate, we are actually a percentage, percentage and a half higher than what the loan, fully loaded cost of a bank borrowing is. But let me tell you, what is bank borrowing here? There's nobody actually lending here. But if I take a three year profitable company which is able to give 100% plus collateral to a bank, and the bank is prepared to finance them. I, to that rate, I may be a person. This is a, you mean No, we in most of the cases, you know, um, we don't get uh, the collaterals like land or property or anything. So it's very uh, very few cases we get collaterals because these are all first-time entrepreneurs who do not have that sort of. Thing. Excuse me, they didn't get. Uh, how much is the rate of interest of the cost of the debt for to the to the okay. customer? See, the thing is, uh, uh, if I had to go by the benchmark rate, which is a prime lending rate, which is available to a three-year, I mean, three fully completed years of profitable organizations who are in a position to give hundred percent collateral, banks charge them sixteen percent. 1, 6. We are a percentage higher. 70%. How do you decide who to charge collateral from and who not to? See, we are uh, financing companies not based on the collateral but based on the business viability. So if a company is viable, collateral is not the issue. But sometimes what happens is there are certain seasonalities or a certain risks which are uh, maybe there in a particular transaction which we have at that time we insist
What is your average? Is your average coupon for lending seventeen percent? Is that yes. what you're saying? Okay. Then, and if you're, how do you give comfort to your investors or the people who are funding this if you're not taking collateral? Okay. Where is the security? Where is the security? I mean, See, the thing is that the profile of the investors here is very, very different. It's not the bank type of investors we invest in. Second is that in this line of business. Uh, Interest is one of the streams of income. Other than this, I charge processing fee, and then based on the company's uh, financials, based on their company's uh, systems and processes, we also offer something called the business development assistance, which is a fee-based service which we give, so which is generally around one, one to one and a half percent. So, and. If the requirement of the company is much more than what we expect we can give, we syndicate part of that amount. So we have four streams of income. That's one. When it comes to the risk, you are talking about the risk. We are into viability based. Say we look at cash flow. We look at promoters. Let me tell you, we, the inherent risk in a business is a problem. So we actually draw a lot of information, and we take comfort of how the Promoter is, and how much promoter has got a holding? So he should be having a significant holding for us to promote. So we take all these things fully and the viability of the business before we even if there's no. That's a good question. It's sort of um, I think the base of your question is how how are if, if nobody else is doing viability based lending in India, what, how can how how can we do it? And I guess all I would say to that is um, the short answer is it's very difficult to do properly. Um, our experience as a foundation uh, is about 10 years doing this kind of lending, though not in India, or we've had um, uh, growth finance uh, partners in Africa that have been doing this very successfully for the last eight, nine years. But it's about looking at this segment, again, very, very differently. But 10, 15 years ago, people did not believe that uh, microfinance clients today were bankable. People didn't believe you could provide finance to those sort of individuals. And now we have a pretty understood microfinance sector. Similarly, if you go back 60 years in the US, there was no venture capital market. Nobody knew how to provide equity funding to, to businesses um, like that. And now we have an established model. And we believe the same thing is true for um, this segment, where if you, if you try to force fit a bank to provide finance to it, it will not work. But if you have um, a very dedicated, very structured, and very careful way of lending, um, i.e., we might not give a, a loan to you for the next three years for general working capital, we lend against a very specific anticipated cash inflow, and it's a different model altogether. So we're, we're partly drawing on lessons we've learned in Africa over the last uh, 10 years or so, um, and also tailoring that to the needs of the Indian market. But it's, um, it isn't easy, I guess it's just a short answer. So my question is more of a follow on to that. Uh, if your equity investors, uh, as you mentioned, seem to understand the force, the, the the theme that you're working with and the type of people that you're working with, you're limited by the amount of equity that you have, therefore, to lend out. Do you see an option, therefore, in raising bank debt for on lending? And do the banks also have the similar mindset, or are you, therefore, constrained by the amount of equity you can raise? Sure. I guess, well, the short answer, money would be able to give you more detail. The short answer is the, the business will be funded with a mixture of equity and debt. And you're starting off with equity, but the plan is to, to, to gear up mainly with mainly with debt, and that debt can come from a variety of sources, potentially banks as well. Yeah, banks will own all the sources, yes. How would the pricing work then? Sorry? How would the pricing work if the banks don't lend? See, the thing is that when it comes to the lending, there's a basket. Bank lending, if today it is not a, we are delisted as a PSL. Okay, sorry, priorities of that low. So, not being a PSL, the, the rate which we'll get is around 40%. That's what is the offer which we're getting. So, um, but then we have routes like SBLC, you have heard of, where it is in single digits, it's 9, 9.5% which you can borrow. 
But if I take the various types of lending put together, and then there are there is securitization. And if I take it on an average, it will come to twelve percent. But if I take a single commercial borrowing into it, yeah, it will be forty percent. But as a basket, if I take it, the average uh, cost of borrowing will be twelve percent. Any other questions on this slide? Yes. Uh, you are saying it's the working capital product. Essentially, I think uh, you mentioned that 60% is the requirement in the working capital, which is the reason you actually focusing towards that specific segment. Yeah. 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 Slide. Yeah. Basically, I just want to understand the product segment because I was not sure. Oh, okay. Working capital. No, no. When we say term loan, term loan, we say it for our internal purpose, but it's working capital as well because it's below 36. Yeah, for the Any other questions? Yes. So when you uh, talk about uh, viability based lending, what are the things you are checking for besides commercial viability? Can you say the last one? Um, what are the factors that you are checking into as part of your viability test beyond commercial viability of the business itself? Um, see, the thing is that we study the, the, the revenue model the revenue model of the company. Now, actually, the, when we do the due diligence, before that, actually, we get the business plan. We, if we expect, we at any particular time, we'll be having their month-on-month -month projection for both PL and cash flow for the next 12 months. Because we go under the assumption when we are giving, when looking at the early desirability test, we look at whether we can do it for 12 months, which should be 18 months. Accordingly, we ask for the cash flows. So we ask for the projections of how it is going to be. Then comes the question is whether these projections are achievable. Now that is where we have that experience and we have the we have outsourced that uh, uh, we have the learnings from South Africa of Pro, Profil, where we have business managers who come and train our people as to how to evaluate. Then we do the scenario analysis as to whether what if there's a swing factor. 10%, 20%, 30% of something going down or the expenses going down. And then we check that back to the cash flow. And if the cash flow is provided hold it or we have to stretch it a little bit, we do a call. So when we look at it, that's the basis by which we get And for us, cash is key. So it's cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. And obviously there's a there's a pretty sharp eye on the, the promoters themselves. So the, the, the and the team. Your success rate, success story. I would want the money back from all the. Yeah. So far, you know, cumulatively, I have lent to 18 uh, companies, and out of that, outstanding is on five, and uh, that is 13 have repaid, or and I have got what's called a 43 percent repeat borrowing. Zero percent is my uh, portfolio at risk. You also train those on successful companies that how they should go further. Yes, that's a business development assistance fee which we charge. In fact, what we have. Uh, uh, yeah. <coughs> that is essentially the true track record. Right, so they, uh, this is as of December, December 2011. So become 18. December 2011, this got spun off into the company. So yes. Are you guys as, a, as an organization profitable? Are you guys as an organization profitable? Yes. So yeah. part of part of the um, part of the longer answer to that um, short answer is yes. The longer answer is that uh, this will become uh, the economics will make sense from an investor point of view when this gets to scale. So we have um, we're probably five, six, ten x larger than we are right now. In the very first year itself, we are profitable. Just like, yeah. In the very first year, we are profitable, and uh, you know, if you take a five-year horizon, we are talking about a return on equity of close to twenty percent and a return on asset of eight percent. My only comment was you're funding out of equity, so I think what you're mentioning is when you build scale and then start, yeah. you know, really seeing the cough in terms of uh, you know the book that you're going to unlend, then that's when I think the real test could be and see the cycles. But but I think that's a great opportunity. Bouncing around here for, yeah. You already mentioned the size of the fund and the size 
the, the size of the overall fund and who the investors are in your fund? I may have missed it. No, we have actually started pitching right now. The first round we are talking about four to five million dollars. Uh -huh. The second round will be somewhere around eight to ten million dollars. To be clear, this is not a fund fund manager structure. It's an MBFC. So we're not raising funds. We're not raising, we're not raising a, a equity fund. It's a business. Um, this is the map, I guess, of for me to, to tailor their remarks. And I'm not sure exactly who is in the room here and, and from what sectors, but this is all this is all to say that um, the, the lending that we have done has been in a variety of different sectors in a variety of different parts of the, the country, uh, all relating back somehow to energy or um, access to, to basic services. Um, we also wanted to bring this up because we weren't, again, not knowing exactly who was in the room. For some of you, this is going to be um, uh, very, very clear and, and well understood. For others, this might be good to have just a quick refresher on why, why debt, and if you're raising money for a for a startup um, in any sector, um, I think there's a what often gets discussed, and even at, at events like this, is the there tends to be a focus because of the lack of availability of debt. There tends to be a focus of the discussion on equity. And a lot, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are out there thinking the only way to fund their business is with equity. Um, but in fact, when we look at the, some of the differences here, Mani is more of an expert on this than, uh, than I am. But we just wanted to highlight a couple of the, the characteristics of debt and equity and, to, and the, the basic message being that they are not mutually exclusive and that when used in combination, um, it is probably it is surely better for both the entrepreneur and the, and the investor. Um, but there are key differences being, um, some of them being, for example, um, debt usually being provided for relatively short term, relatively specific usage, um, like <coughs> being longer term, open, open ended, uh, open ended funds. Um, obviously, this is a typical situation where debt is typically provided only with, <laughs> with collateral. Um, although, obviously, not what we're talking about here. But is anybody? I don't want to dwell on this too much because I think a lot of you will be familiar with this. Is there anybody though? Who has any questions about debt versus equity? Um, in some cases, what we've, we've actually lent on the back of um, uh, an equity investment it reduces the reduces your equity requirement, reduces the dilution of the business, and equally increases the, the rate of return for for every investor from equity as well as um, voters and clients. Um, One thing about uh, uh, yes, it's not a slanging match between debt and equity, but both complement each other. Like you are able to raise debt, because, and then you know you're raising equity. You're able to, because you have got equity, you're able to raise debt. But once you raise the debt, there are in the in this sector. Why we are talking about is formal uh, borrowings uh, are very difficult to come by. So when you are able to raise debt, the formal line, then you are able to raise more. Debt. At the same time, I can uh, give an example that out of the one million dollars which is our uh, portfolio, which are we are lent, $2.2 million is the leveraging my clients to benefit from. Out of that, a couple of them got to because we gave it. So that's a leveraging opportunity. What is it to the end customer? So it's not, a, it's not that it's debt versus equity or equity versus debt. Both are very important. But we are addressing the debt part of it. Yes? Just a, just a philosophical question because yeah. uh, um, I don't get it where your um, where your money are coming from, uh, and uh, this is one question. The second question is, uh, I find that this, the period that you use to stay the company is very short, three years, uh, and the the return is sixteen percent. That for my opinion is high. So, what's the link uh, between your business that I, I judge as uh, very profitable and the social enterprises? Uh, it's not very social. It's so very profitable. So just, and yeah. how can we can be sure that uh, the Western capital invest uh, in developing country, in, in East country? with a very high return that they don't have in their Western company, country. So it's a good, so, it's a, it's a good, it's a good excuse question. Excuse me, I'm, I'm ignorant, but it's, uh, 
I ask you to clear this this point. Sure. So the first, the first, it's a good question, and I guess what I would say to that is for um, North American or European audiences, um, sub ten percent lending, or uh, sorry, ten uh, percent plus lending sounds incredibly expensive. Um, in a world where you might come from, where, where you're, you can get debt at three, four percent, charging sixteen percent yeah. or seventeen percent for a loan sounds expensive. But as Mani pointed out. Um, the banks here are not lending at 1%, they're lending at 15, 16% collateralized. So it's a different market altogether, right? This is not the US market, it's not the European market. If we could lend profitably at 5% or 6%, we would be lending at that rate. But this, this is not the social enterprise, because if you are a USA, USA company and you yeah. invest in India and you have 16%, <coughs> it's very profitable. Yeah. Why don't you? Uh, by 8%. Right. So we won't go into this too much um, for the sake of the rest of the audience, but as a foreign lender, you cannot lend in India. So somebody, a bank, a, an American bank cannot lend uh, to Indian yeah. companies. So there's, there's, otherwise, indeed, there would be quite an arbitrage opportunity. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, that's another good point. So inflation in India is... Um, is what, close 10, to 9%. 10, 9%. So you cannot have an interest rate which is less than 9%. It's just, it's just the inflation factor. And actually, you know, like they say now, right now, you know, um, the GDP of India is expected to be around 7%. They say that the, um, the currency will move, stabilize between 48 to 51. Uh, I'm sorry, a dollar is equal to 48 rupees to 51. In that band it should move, but it's actually 51 rupees to 20 percent as of yesterday. I don't know today, but I see. So given all this foreign exchange fluctuation, interest rate, inflation rate, uh, it's very difficult for somebody to give it a take this the other, The other part of your question was around the, the short-term nature of the debt and why why so short-term. And I guess all I can say is half, I guess almost almost half or just a little bit more than half, I'm not sure what the latest numbers are, clients come back to Intellibro for a second loan. So the idea is not to do 12-month or 18-month lending and then get out. It's actually to repeat and, and refresh that loan every uh, every loan period. So. Um, that is, that is the one point. And a lot of the clients that we have are selling products with a turnover of four, five, six times a year and are making you know 10 plus percent margins on that. So if you look at the effect, the net economic effect of the capital that we're providing is far, far, far higher than, than the lending rate. So it often, we need to look at that lending rate in context about what the, what the business is doing and how it, how it fits in. Otherwise, it can be expensive. You're yeah. presently lending to the private lending companies. And public lending companies. And public lending companies. No one else is other than No, as a forms of uh, business organizations, these are. Can you walk us through a case study, if possible, uh, and how the finance, how, how, how the debt repayment cycles worked out over three years? A. Okay. Can, can you just give me a microphone? Hello. Can you Yeah. Can you walk us through a case study if that's possible, if that's appropriate, how the debt repayment cycles worked out over the over three years, A, and B, since you guys don't invest in social enterprises, but from what I understand, socially relevant enterprises, what kind of impacts have you guys possibly created? So we can share conceptually that some of the clients that we've lent to and the purpose of the of the loan, we're not going to, we can't obviously share the specific that's details and loan terms of, of, of what we've offered, but um, Trying to think of a good example, we could we could talk about maybe Vortex Engineering. Vortex, which is a yeah. good one because Vortex. it's been at um, Suncalp in the past, which is a manufacturer yeah. of manufacturer of uh, solar uh, driven ATMs, powered ATMs, and um, there you know they were actually supplying to solar power. You know, I don't know the Vortex. Have you heard of Vortex? Have people heard of Vortex? You know, see conventional ATMs are driven by power, and they require a air condition. And these ATMs, they got it's got a patented uh, product, the product which is available, in which it is being put in various uh, rural areas in India, and the most of it is being done by State Bank of India has accepted all these products, and now all the other national banks have to do it. Here you don't require the power. It first thing in the morning, you know, it around seven o'clock. Once the sun is up, it's, the power starts going. You can operate it. It can use loose nodes. And then what happens is, once the sun goes down, if there's a battery which is powered, it runs it. But after 10 o'clock in the night, the battery runs out. But in the rural area, nobody ventures out after 10 o'clock in the night. Now, this company, when they think they had initially the equity investment, but they needed debt to take care of their working capital requirements. 
and there was a what we studied was that there was a from the time they deliver the the, the ATM moves out of their uh, shop floor and then goes into uh, you know there is it goes to another company which actually installs it in a rural area and then there is a period of four weeks when the complete connectivity and synchronization all happens. Once that happens, then only they get the payment. So there was a gap of around four months to four and a half months for each ATM. So we studied month by month how much of uh, ATMs they produce, when does it leave, we studied the entire uh, cycle and then when the money comes back. So based on that, we actually did, uh, we, we gave the money. So every time, so we used to have a situation that we gave it for a period of nine months, but they repaid it in eight months itself because the money came back faster than they expected. But first three months, we were right on the target. But subsequently, you know, because maybe because the banks also drew comfort, they started paying money earlier. So because of that, we closed it up. So they came back to us twice. First one, which we gave it for eight months, they paid it back. Then six months later, they again came in, came back because PNB and other banks gave them a big order. So they came back to us, we again financed this, and they repaid that back in four months. Exactly. Do you have a milestone driven repayment period or is it sort of flexible? Yeah, it is driven by the cash flow. And okay. the cash flow determines it will be four months or five months. See, if we think it is four months, we still determine leave it for five months because we don't want to uh, we don't want to push the customer and we don't have a see we determine the cash flow cycle from the time it leaves and time he gets the money. In six months, we give even seven months. And we don't charge prepayment penalty if he gives it us in six months. There will be prepayment penalty if he gives it to me in three months. But in six months he gives it, because it's early determined. But why I give seven months is that I don't want him to get pressurized. We can't you, uh, ask power system, we went to um, uh, energy companies, we went to uh, companies where you see very clear seasonal sales spikes, where you might not have one buyer, you might have hundreds of buyers, but in order to take advantage of that seasonal sales spike, which historically can be incredibly clear, particularly if you're in the agricultural business. Uh, very clear case, we've lent a few times there where it's worked incredibly well. We've just allowed the company to take advantage of that seasonal sales spike. There, there is this company, a drip irrigation company, and um, we have given the money twice. We, the second one we gave it last month. So there, you know what used to happen, I was telling in the beginning, that um, you give them money uh, before the monsoon. You know, they sell all their equipments before monsoon, because that's when it is required the most. Post monsoon, so just the monsoon, there are two cycles of monsoon. The first one comes before June. Okay, June onwards it starts and then it ends in September. We noticed that there's a double hump. The sales of that particular company was a double hump. Now, the first hump was something around 56% of the sale or 58% of the sale happens between February and June. But the money of that comes in June, July, August, September, like that. It comes. So that's a one hump. Then the second hump is from October to Jan, which is roughly around 40. The rest of them are all small ones. So we always end up financing during just before the hump so that they can scale up their uh, production, they can sell it to the farmers or the distributors, and then you know wait for the money to come back. So that's the other one. So that's a very interesting case. So you say you do penalize for early payment. <laughs> Sorry? You do penalize for early payment. So far, we have not had a situation where we have penalized somebody, but yes, we have a prepayment uh, clause. But uh, since we are, uh, you know, um, I mean, I'm not saying it as a, as a fact I'm telling, but we are very good in determining that cash flow back. So we determine if it is going to be six months, we doubt whether anybody can pay for four months. So far, we have not had it. But yes, if it, we are determined six months and they give it in four months, we will certainly charge yeah, because I'm, I'm just thinking of the example that you quoted where the ATMs for SBI. Mm. That was because we determined there, uh, when we gave them the sanction letter, we said up to six months. If you're prepaying it after six months, there will be no prepayment. So we go by that. But suppose he comes back and pays it the fourth month, yes, there will be have, have you studied any of these cases to see, in some of these cases, have they been able to go and get refinanced with the lower debt? See, the thing is, so far, the clients I have uh, given, see, the, uh, let me tell you, if you are applying loans to the banks, I don't know how many here have applied, but if you are a startup and you don't have a three-year profitable track record and audited balance sheet, and if you don't have collateral, you are not the best. I'm not trying to scare you guys, but I'm telling you, I have pitched for any of my uh, 
uh, SME clients with the bank and I know what it is. I've taken at least half a dozen to the bank. It's still in the process. And you take a DFI, it takes one year for them to appraise it. One of the group companies have applied, it's one year. And uh, if you take bank, minimum six months, minimum. Because I'm again coming back to example, and with all due respect for this particular company that you're talking about, uh, if they did the product for SBI, and over a period of time, I mean, obviously their returns are pretty good. So they would have had good collateral. So I'm wondering where would they come back to you if they had the banks at one percentage lower that they most, most probably could go, go back to? You can go to the bank. If he is in a position to give a collateral, go to the bank. Let him go to the bank. Because as he said, this, this area is $20 billion which is there. I'm not going to stop him from going to the bank. If he has to go to the bank, go to the bank. So all of, our, all of the customers we lend to now, for whatever reason, have not been able to attract bank finance. And if they can't attract bank finance, they shouldn't be our customer. Uh, because banks indeed will have a slightly lower rate than we have. Uh, yes. This is regarding your revenue model. How much of it does come from debt, finance, debt repayment and how much of it is from BD support? I'm so, so how much of your re uh, revenue comes from debt repayments and how much of it comes from uh, business development assistance that you also provide. Right now it's all uh, interest. It's all, it's all interest. Interest. So We're going to be adding uh, different revenue streams going, going forward. And we are only three months old as a company. As a new investor. As a new investor. Simple question. How do you market yourself? Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> you may not be the... Okay. The, no, yeah, yeah. You are talking about how do we build our pipeline for the business. No, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, we actually see Sankalp is one of the forums. So we we go for where there are multi-stakeholders who are involved. In it. When I say that, here we have uh, investors, we have uh, people, small and medium enterprise, which will be looking for loans. Likewise, you know, like uh, uh, there's a summit. At least, say there's an energy summit, or there's a healthcare summit. Or you know, depending on the industries in which we are interested in, we will be good there in that particular case to get a focus to So that's how we'll be, and there are various events in which we'll be participating. Sankalp is one in which we are participating. And Shell is actually. But we, but the, the, short, the, 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 short, the short answer is that we haven't, and the reason why nobody in the room has heard of Intelligrid before is because we have not done any kind of formal marketing yet. We haven't needed to. So the, the, the demand for debt has far exceeded the capital we have to to on land. Uh, so it hasn't been a huge need, but indeed, um, uh, very soon I think the idea is to, to raise the profile of this, of this company. So I do believe it is pretty unique in, in India. So um, going back to that, as an NBFC, you're constrained to domestic fundraising. How do you intend on growing your business? Because I think you're really limited in scope if you're only able to fundraise in India for a business of this nature, especially a new, a new, you know, this type of new structure, a new opportunity. If you can't attract foreign capital, how are you going to grow your business? So, yeah, without wanting to go into a huge discussion about MBFC capitalization, um, we are allowed to have a certain portion of, of foreign uh, capital. Um, and the second part of the answer is that there are, um, we would be in trouble if there were no Indian investors in this country. Fortunately, there are. <laughs> are there enough to sustain a growth for your, your business? Yeah, the amount which we are looking for, I mean, right now the Indian uh, uh, in, uh, domestic investors are quite big and strong. The corpus which is available from domestic investors is quite big compared to what it was five years back. And it's growing. And this particular company will always be a 49% owned by foreign investors, 51 investors. This slide is just uh, very quickly to talk through the, the stage. If any of you are, are interested in debt, um, uh, what, an, what an application process would look like, and we're not going to go through all of this. All, all this to say, it's, it's basically a five-step process. It's short, um, and the speed at which we can operate is a function of the degree to which you can provide uh, information to us. So if that, if that information takes six weeks to come in, then it might take longer for us to disperse. But if all that information is, is available there. And, and all the, I don't want to dwell on this. Uh, yeah, but what I'm saying is that once we get the full information for us to do the due diligence, we take three weeks to roll out this action. Three weeks. Once we get the full information. On a, on a robust scenario, we found six weeks. That is, 
from the time the customer sent the first set of papers, we asked questions and he called back to the time we gave. So six weeks is what is a period from the time of getting the information to the rolling out. But I'm saying if the full information of the due diligence is completed, we take only three weeks. Question. What does that compare to um, what banks are the time process for banks? Yeah, banks is anywhere between uh, six months to nine months. In DFI, it's 12 months. Well, I think. Very attractive, they can do it in two weeks. I'm not talking about corporates. See, there is, a, there is a if it is if it is a rated corporate, which is a P1 plus, then we are not talking about that. The scale of comparison is totally not there. I think technically a bank can disperse a loan in 24 hours, but um, we would struggle to find examples. Two weeks? I put up my hand, give me a loan. No one. So this is pretty much it. Um, just to say that we're part of the Intellis Capital Group. Um, this is how to get in touch. Um, are there any other questions either about Intellibro or the overall debt um, market in general? to the SME sector. What would be your suggestions for somebody who was aiming to do that? Would it be a first class guarantee? Would it be, I mean, just, just See, the thing is that it's, uh, it's something, you know, which we work with the banks for the sake of the SME clients. But the thing is, as I said in the beginning, it's very really difficult to make banks do exactly what you like because they're governed by certain things which is set by the RBI norms certain things which is said by their investors or their uh, corporate clients. And that which is external, like a Basel III or a stress test. So, and driven also by another problem, which is a high operating cost of the banks. Because of that, they go for higher prices. Where we come into the picture, I mean, sooner, probably six months from now, we'll syndicate our firms, where, you know, we will tell them that we, have, we do all the things and put it across to them. And we take, of the, take care of the funding for the first leg, probably they will, we can work together with the bank. But making the banks work faster, at this stage we find it difficult. Because maybe because of the, the present global situation, and banks generally are at this particular point carrying high MPAs. It's a, an honest thing is, it's a very difficult task. It's also one I think we're just not looking at it like that. I just don't, but it's almost like asking banks 10 years ago to serve microfinance customers where you could force fit a bank to serve MFI customers and you gave them 16 guarantees and then had special relationships with CSR departments of banks. Um, but we don't believe that's a scalable route. I think by the same token, I don't think you'll ever see banks serving this sector in, in a dedicated way. I think you'll see examples of them dipping into that sector, but I don't, this, is not, this is not a bank's business to, to be in that thing. But I might, uh, there might be some bankers in the room that might take issues with that. Popular, uh, I have a question, please. Uh, this is a very interesting idea, a very interesting business, and if it works well, it will be scaled up. In a sense, it will be replicated. There will be others will be interested in set this up. Others have already studied this kind of a model in you know, SME financing, financial institution, but where they have struggled is right now you are working, you are know, letting out equity. The moment you leverage your equity, for an Indian NBFC, your weighted average cost of funds to be less than 40 to 14 and a half percent is going to be extremely challenging. I mean, that's the business plans which have been thrown up earlier for such for businesses. So that's A. And B is so far because they've been very small. You've done a few transactions, you don't have any NPA or stress presence in your book. The, I'm sure you'll have to make some provisions, 2 percent, 2 and a half percent of the We make provisions. You have to do that. So, I mean, I still don't understand the uh, long term, once you leverage yourself and you grow to a 20 million company as to where the profits are in this company. You're talking about the... Uh, uh, and even the operating cost, you talk about the banks having high operating cost. But here, with I don't know how big your team is, but you are, you know, originating loans from across the country. I mean, it's it's a very expensive process. So it's more, uh, it's more expensive. Economics are more expensive than a bank. There's no question. So the returns on Telegro from an investor perspective are going to be lower than a bank is able to gear up 20 times. There's no question. But that does not mean that there aren't economics that work. Uh, See, the thing is that it's 20% after tax return on equity in five years. We're talking about a 17 million 
portfolio. And we are talking about a leveraging of one each. Okay. So, what you said, you were interested in the setup of the business earlier? Earlier, what kind of a legal form were you doing? So, it's always been an MBFC. We were just incubating it under yeah, one under of Under IntelliCash. So, this is an MBFC. The incubating. Yes, sir. So, Sydney also provides a few collateral free loans. Enterprises are, how is your, uh, your compared to that in terms of interest rates and process timing? Yeah, Sydney is certainly there. Um, and I think a lot of, just like every other institution, a lot of institutions claim to be doing this. Um, in reality, the constraints we're seeing are that either they are under resourced to provide debt at scale, um, or even worse for a, a small and growing business is that they'll take nine to 12 months to process the loan. So in, in, there are certain pockets of government funding that might be out there that are technically dedicated to this space. In reality, their ability to, to, to actually deploy capital to small and growing businesses. I mean, if, I think if we took a poll in this room of entrepreneurs who are actually looking for debt, um, how many have found them in, in, in existing organizations? I think it's, it's uh, really many. But you're right. There are there are pockets of, of funding available that are, in principle, dedicated to that. That's it. Are you referring to the CGT MSCs? Yes. That's only for the banks. How many other companies think providing similar loans to India? This profile is like moving out there. Yeah, we don't know of any other businesses in India that they're actually because it's a general, it's not just in Telegram, but it's a wider debt session. There are a number of interesting uh, businesses that are popping up in the MFI plus segment. So there are interesting um, companies in, in uh, I know one in Bangalore, for example, is doing um, sort of two, three lakh loans. Um, that is a that is a really interesting segment. It's not the segment that we're we're after, but we have not seen uh, we have not seen lenders that are looking at the size of. Uh, yeah, so we can go up to two They may see they may be they but what I'm saying is the focus on the sector is very clear. That's to answer the question. Is it we are not scaling up, we are not going beyond this particular our scale is on this sector only. We are not going to digress for this. We are not going to mid caps. So the question which was asked earlier and some allied to that question comes is there's something called small, micro and medium. Now micro we are not into it. We are into small, which we define what we are. Then there's something called the medium. The medium companies are nothing but mid caps. And that's where all these problems start. You cannot lend at 14.5, you cannot lend at 14. And there the banks get into the picture. So we are not going to digress. We are going to just be in the small. So I think uh, specifically, you mentioned that your loan size is typically you latch to that couple of crores, right? Yeah. So if you say a loan size of a crore plus, yeah. would it Telegro be one of the unique companies in the space that provide that local actor sub 20% loans or are there others like yourself with this? See, as of now, as of now, people claim that they are doing it's immediately. But let's take, uh, I have to give a names, so let's take Tata Capital. A data capital's ticket size is anywhere from 5 crores to 50 crores. The median falls at 32 crores. But 32 crores ticket size is not a small. So there are all, uh, there is a relic air, there is X, there is Y. But the ticket size of 5 crores, 10 crores plus. And most of them, like for instance, uh, uh, Virla uh, Finance Company, it's captive businesses there. But the ticket size, is median, is somewhere around 10. They are not actually in the segment where I am. See, everybody uses the word SME. But SME, the three-letter acronym, spreads across itself into billions of dollars. I am focused on that which is small. And that's where my focus will remain. And that, at this point, is unbankable. And will continue to be unbankable also, given the norms. Yeah, sure answer. Focus is very clear. We don't have anybody else that's serving this sector in a dedicated way. Any other last questions? We're happy to end the... Uh, okay, what problems you have early. faced during your initial years in this partnership? I can talk about uh, 1998 when I started in Kodak Mahindra. At that time, SME, though a three-letter acronym, was a four-letter word. 
because in 1998 we had the Asian contagion and uh, South Asia was swept and uh, Far East was having lots of problems. And at that time, nobody understood what SME was. Okay. So the acceptability at that time as an SME was non existent. But if I have to look at our 18 months of experience, we, this 18 months of experience, what we realized, the, the problems which we were coming across with the entrepreneurs, where we did not end, was their focus. Where their focus, why we have determined 12, 12 months minimum they should be on their own before we come into the picture, is that they have taken a call and they will be there. So where they are not there for more than 12 months, their commitment has to be there, their shareholding has to be there. We had given, in this last 18 months, we had given to one particular client who was there for less than 12 months and we had a little bit of problem before we got the money, but it was not a We got all the money back to the client. But yes, the focus of the SME client is something which is important. So we give a lot of importance to the promoter, we give a lot of importance to the inherent risk which is there. That's all. Challenges that we have are the same challenges of any small and growing business. Oh yeah, we have got to engage a psychometric test before that. You pass this, then you get it. <coughs> but we're looking for, uh, in terms of gaps, we are looking for talent. So there are all sorts of opportunities to join um, Intelligroves.